Hi. Hi, everyone. So welcome to my talk, and thanks very much for coming. My name is Adam. Uh, I originally come from the UK. Um, I come from uh, a small town which is very near to where John Skeet lives. Uh, he lives in Reading, but obviously he's a lot more well-known than I am. Um, I don't, has anyone here seen the, uh, that there's, a, there's a, a thread on Stack Overflow, um, or I think it might be the meta, uh, which talks about um, John in terms of Ch Chuck Norris. Have you seen that? And it's like, you know, Chuck, when, when this happens, Chuck Norris does this, but it's the same thing with John. And uh, there are some really amusing ones, like John Skeet can divide by zero. And uh, John Skeet created his last project in paint.net just because he could. And uh, my favorite one is, John Skeet has just finished writing the book for the next version of C Sharp, and when the .NET team release it, they'll open the book and read it to check they got it right. And uh, actually, I, I saw John on the way in yesterday. Uh, we were actually on the same flight. So I was at Heathrow, and I was queuing in this long, snaking queue to get onto the plane. And this figure kind of sauntered past into the priority queue. And I thought, I know him. That's John Skeet. And I thought, well, maybe we'll be sitting near each other on the plane, and we can, uh, we can have a little bit of a chat. But of course, I was at the back somewhere, and I could just see him somewhere in business class. Um, I think he had a, a might have a glass of champagne or something. And, uh, then, uh, then I thought, well, you know, we're riding the same flight. Maybe we'll get the same taxi to the hotel. Um, so I was there at passport control, and obviously John's queue went much faster than mine. And uh, I got through to the entrance hall, but John was nowhere to be seen. And uh, okay. Um, anyway, I, I now live in Switzerland, and I work for a company called uh, Particular Software, with the makers of Service Bus. I'm not going to talk about that too much. Um, what I will say is that. Uh, particular software is a remote working company. We work 100% remote, and I'm putting that to the test now, and this is my home. This is my current home. So this is actually parked somewhere in uh, the UK right now, in Cornwall, and uh, my, my girlfriend's keeping it warm. So when I leave here, I'll be going back here, and we're going to be traveling around in this for about six months. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'm probably going to start a blog post on it, and I may even do a talk about it next year. So um, on to something more relevant. So I'm going to talk about .NET Standard today. Um, and these happen to be some of the packages that I look after on the NuGet gallery. So fake it easy, a mocking, uh, a mocking library. Xbehave.net is an extension to XUnit. Uh, LightGuard is a silly little guard clause library. You know, it just allows you to do guard against null. Um, it's really, really useful because it allows me to try out all these cool new things like .NET Standard on a really trivial code base, which is actually just one, uh, one uh, um, C Sharp file. And, um, and, that's, and it's really good for that. Um, and then I look after end service bus RabbitMQ uh, as part of my job. We actually have about 100 NuGet packages on, on, on NuGet. Um, to do with end service bus, and this just happens to be the one that I look after as part of my job. And in terms of .NET standard support, um, fake it easy, xbehave.net, and lightguard all support .NET standard already. Uh, that wasn't too hard to do. Um, the, the, these are the versions 1.6, 1.6, and 1.0. And end service bus RabbitMQ, not yet, but I'll come to that a little bit more in a second. So what is .NET standard? What is this thing? Um, I think the, the best way to explain that is to talk about what it's designed to solve. So in the early days of .NET, in 2002, uh, .NET, Standard, uh, .NET Framework 1 was released. And things are very simple. You compiled against .NET Framework 1. You ran against .NET Framework 1, right? And then later on, .NET Framework 2 came out, then 3.5, 4, 4.5, 4.6, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these days, things are very different. So we have many more platforms that we want to run on. We want to run .NET code on phones. We want to run it on uh, tablets. Um, does anyone know what Tizen is? A few of you. Anyone want to shout it out? TV, yes. Um, well, it's, it's yes, Samsung. Uh, so Samsung decided to release this .NET um, runtime for things like TVs and I think smartwatches and things. Um, so. The, 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 
the places that we're going to be running .NET code, .NET code is expanding all the time and continues to expand. Um, now, as a producer of a NuGet package, and also as obviously a consumer of a NuGet package, I would like to be able to use the current, well, I would like to be able to use NuGet packages when I target something like Xamarin Android, or Tizen, or any of these. And as a NuGet package producer, I'd like to enable you to do that. I'd like you to be able to take my NuGet package and run it on any of these platforms. So, a while back, uh, the .NET team realized this, and they come up with something called, uh, oh, sorry, yes, I forgot about that slide, that's just Tizen, proving to you that it really does exist. Um, they come up with something called portable class libraries, and let's investigate those a little bit. So, uh, I, I, I actually refer to them as the portable class library fiasco, um, and I'll explain why. So, in the beginning, things are very simple. You had the .NET Framework 4, for instance, and then something called Silverlight came along. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but I, I, when I put together this diagram, I actually misspelled Silverlight, Sliverlight, um, but I decided to leave it like that. And the idea was that in order to be able to run a NuGet package on either of these platforms, the .NET team would provide something called a portable class library profile. And that is the intersection of the APIs available on these two platforms. And it happens to be called Profile 14. If anyone knows what 14 means and why it's 14, then please tell me, because I have no idea. But it's Profile 14. All well and good. So uh, what I could do now as a new Git package producer is produce a special assembly targeted, targeted at Profile 14, which was a reference assembly with just the intersection of the APIs. And then you will be able to take that assembly and run it on either the .NET Framework or Silverlight. Bring in another platform into the mix, and .NET Core 4.5 was a thing at one point. Uh, it, it's kind of gone, it's gone away now. Uh, the versionings are very confusing, but this still does exist, supposedly. If you, if you look at the list of PCL profiles, Profile 5 is .NET Framework 4 and .NET Core 4.5. Whatever .NET Core 4.5 is, I don't know. And uh, then we've got Profile 14, which we saw before, and in the middle we've now got Profile 37, which is the intersection of all three of those platforms. Okay, all well and good. What if we have a fourth platform? So I've introduced here Windows Phone 8, for what it's worth. And there's an obvious problem with this diagram. Can anyone spot it? I mean, the clue is in the diagram. Pardon? Too many profiles. It's starting to get that way. You're right. Um, but the, the specific thing I, I, I was referring to was that I've got nowhere to put profile 14. Right? Because remember, I'll just go back one slide. Profile 14 is the intersection of .NET Framework 4 and Silverlight 5. Um, I, I have nowhere to put that on that diagram. Right. Uh, it turns out, this is a bit embarrassing for me because I did maths at university. Um, and uh, I'll just go back again. So this is a Venn diagram. Right? Venn diagrams were invented by a British mathematician called John Venn in the 19th century. And what a Venn diagram does is it shows all the intersections of all the sets. So there are three sets there and, there is the, and the intersection of all of them is represented somewhere on that diagram. That is not the case for this diagram. It turns out that this isn't a Venn diagram. This is a Euler, an Euler diagram. And these were invented by a Swiss mathematician called uh, Leonard Euler in the 18th century. And what a, an Euler diagram does is it represents some of the intersections between the sets. And this is another example of an Euler diagram. Um, this is the UK and Ireland and all the various uh, bits that make it up. Um, so if anyone asks me where I'm from and what is the UK, all I have to do is verbalize this very simple diagram to explain it to them. And I, I think I knew about all of these apart from the British Islands. That was uh, 
That was news to me. But anyway, um, back to this. So how do we, how do we represent this uh, on, on, a, on a Venn diagram? Well, Google was, was, uh, was my friend on this, and it turns out that this is a four-set Venn diagram. And it really is. Uh, I can actually apply some of the profiles to that. And we can see that profile 14 now has a home again. Uh, we've got a new thing called profile 136, which has appeared. Um, again, I don't know what any of these numbers mean. If anyone does, then please let me know. Um, and then if you look at the PCL, the list of PCL profiles, it doesn't just stop at four. So this one here actually has five, right? We've now got, uh, what's, what's, oh, WPA81, what is that, Windows Phone App 8.1 8 or something? So that appears, now we've got five platforms, and of course, you can't possibly draw a five-set Venn diagram. Or so I thought. Uh, so, so, so this actually is a five-step Venn diagram, and if you, if you look at it closely, it, 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 it really is. And then you can get even more silly, and uh, you can go to a six-step Venn diagram, and uh, uh, this is a, a seven-step Venn diagram. And in 2012, a group, a group of very, very clever people at the University of Victoria in British Columbia drew for the very first time an 11-step Venn diagram. Uh, a symmetric one, that is. There were asymmetric ones before, but this is the first um, symmetric one. And it, it's supposedly impossible to go any higher. And I try to apply our platforms to this. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I really, th this is really lost on me. I don't know if anyone else can, can kind of see what's going on here. Um, anyway, I've made up this profile number in the middle, obviously, because I've added things like ties and into it, which didn't exist at the time of profile uh, PCLs. Um, but I'm going to go and call fiasco on that. If you need a, if you need a PhD in maths to draw, to, to diagram your PCL profiles, and things are clearly going wrong. And the problem here, of course, is that every single time you add a new platform, you potentially double the amount of profiles. And when new things like um, ASP, ASP Net Call 50 came along, remember that was a thing at one time? and DNX and things like that, um, the, the number of PCL profiles were just exploding. It was getting completely unmanageable, and they were having to come up with incredibly long numbers, and, and this, this, this was, wasn't going to work. So what is the solution? Well, it's .NET standard, right? This is, this is the solution to this. Um, I, I actually submitted this as a logo, but they, they, they didn't like it. Um, so this is what .NET standard is designed to do. Uh, Instead of looking at the intersections between all the various platforms, it, it just looks at the intersection of all of them. It just says, well, what's common to all of these platforms? Which types and methods are actually available on all of these platforms? And that is the .NET standard. It's just that bit in the middle. And it tries to take as large a piece of that intersection as it can. And the various versions of .NET standard, from 1 to 1.6 and to 2, which I'll talk about in a second, build on each other. So .NET standard 1 is a smaller intersection in the middle, which covers uh, many more platforms. And .NET 1.1 is a slightly larger set of APIs, but some of those APIs are not available on Windows Phone Silverlight 8, so that one is not supported by 1.1. And as you go through the versions, uh, that, that pattern follows. So uh, 1.1 is a, is a superset of 1.0, 1.2 is bigger, 1.3 is bigger, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 2.0 is out here, but I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the documentation on this is fantastic. This is, uh, it, uh, there, there is a repo which has a diff between every single version of .NET standard. This is the diff between 1.3 and 1.4. It's a very, very small one. It's actually the smallest one. And as you can see, they've, they've added a type. They've added another type and a few enum members. So really not much to 1.4 compared to 1.3. Um, but as you can see, uh, yes, so the difference is, is there. Right? So there's something, in, there's something that .NET 4.6.1 supports that 4.6 doesn't, and that's baked into .NET standard 1.4. 
So how does this work? Well, the most important thing is to separate compilation and runtime in your mind, because th these are two completely different scenarios. When you compile, all you do is take C Sharp and produce uh, an assembly. And all you need to do that is a reference assembly. So uh, if you reference system.object in your code, that's not just system.object, it's some DLL system.object. So in the, in the case of classic.NET Framework, it's MS Core Lib system object. In the case of .NET Standard, all of those types live in a .NET Standard DLL. So when you refer to system object in a .NET Standard class library, you're referring to .NET Standard DLL system object. And when you compile, all that happens is the compiler just compiles against that .NET Standard DLL and produces your .NET Standard class library. So things are very simple. At runtime, things are slightly more complicated. This is where we introduce the notion of type forwarding. Does everyone know what type forwarding is? Um, I mean, it's been around since the very beginning of .NET, since uh, I, think, I, think it's, I think since .NET Framework uh, uh, 1.0. And all it does, it gives the ability for an assembly to say, hey, I contain this type. And then when you actually ask for the type, it says, well, no, that's not true. It's actually in that assembly over there. So it just forwards the caller of a type to another assembly. So what happens at runtime with .NET Standard is I may be referencing my .NET Standard class library from my .NET Framework application, and my .NET Framework application references the framework assemblies, e.g. MS Core Lib. So what happens at runtime is when, when the .NET Standard class library refers to system object, it says, well, it actually wants system object, uh, net standard DLL system object, and net standard DLL says, oh, actually, you want MS Core Lib system object. Does that more or less make sense? Yeah, I see nodding heads. So, again, a little bit more complicated, but not, not rocket science, and, uh, and things just work. So, uh, back to this table. So, I did say I was going to talk a bit more about not, uh, .NET Standard 2.0. Um, as you see, .NET Standard 2.0 is currently only supported by the .NET Framework 4.6.1, which we have right now, and .NET Core 2, which is in preview right now, it's not released yet, and whatever the next versions are of Mono, Xamarin, and UWP. So, if we look back to .NET Standard 1, uh, the, the, main, the main points of feedback that the .NET team received about .NET Standard 1 were limitations and paralysis. And these are the things that they wanted to address in .NET Standard 2. So what do I mean by limitations? Well, if we look back at this diagram, what you'll notice is that that circle in the middle, and obviously this is all drawn to scale, is much smaller than the .NET Framework 4.6.1 circle or any of the others. And in fact, the, it is kind of more or less the scale when you start looking into it. So, what this means is that many of the APIs that you have in .NET Framework, or .NET Core, or UWP, are simply not available in .NET Standard 1.6. Now, things like IE Data Reader, you know, things that are fairly fundamental but just are not in .NET Standard 1.6 because they're not, all, they're not in all the platforms. The idea of .NET Standard 2 is to do this. So the intersection has got much, much wider, and that has the effect of drawing all the platforms together a bit. Because now, in order to support .NET Standard 2, every platform has to support a much wider API, which means they have much more in common as well. And in fact, the difference between uh, .NET Standard 1.6 and .NET Standard 2.0 in terms of APIs, where APIs means uh, methods and properties, uh, is vast. There are if I remember correctly, 13,500 APIs in .NET Standard 1.6 and around 34,000 in .NET Standard 2. So it's a 142% increase. So massive, massive difference. And earlier I showed you this diff between 1.3 and 1.4. If you try and look at the diff between 1.6 and 2.0, GitHub just gives up and just says that. Uh, the file is simply too big for it to show in the GUI. So it's an, it's an enormous difference. So that 
should hopefully take care of most of the limitations. So, what do I mean by paralysis? Pretty much any, uh, well, maybe that's not true, not any non-trivial NuGet package, but a lot of NuGet packages depend on other NuGet packages. Right? I'm sure that's not news to, to anyone here. So, for instance, Fake It Easy depends on Castle Core. Uh, NService plus Rabbit depends on NService plus, obviously, and the Rabbit client. Uh, NService bus itself depends on Autofac and Utisoft.json, as does the world. And as you can see, there's a two step dependency chain here from NService bus Rabbit to NService bus to Utisoft.json. And these dependency chains can sometimes be a lot bigger. You can sometimes have dependency chains five or six deep. Uh, it's, not, it's not unheard of. So the problem is, if you want to support .NET standard, how do you do that before your dependencies support it? So b before dot, b Newton, dot, Newtonsoft.json does now support .NET standard, but before it, before it did, it was very hard for a lot of the NuGet ecosystem to support .NET standard because they just had to wait for JSON.NET to support it. And that's been a bit of a problem, uh, and it continues to be a problem. Uh, people are still waiting for their dependencies to support .NET standard before they can. So the idea uh, that Microsoft had to solve this is, oops, is reference anything. So you're no longer constrained to only referencing .NET standard libraries from your .NET standard library. Uh, reference anything is perhaps a bit of an overstatement. I believe it may only be .NET framework libraries. Uh, and you can actually see Immo Landworth doing this if you follow this, uh, this, this path down uh, through YouTube. And uh, oh, by the way, the slides are available online, so you don't have to try and memorize this. And I've done this talk a few times at user groups before today. This is the first time I'm giving it to a large audience. And at this time, I normally said, well, I'd love to show you it, but I can't because the preview bits are not available. However, the preview bits were released eight days ago. So I'm going to give it a try. Right, let's see if this works. And incidentally, uh, I couldn't get this to work yesterday, and one of my colleagues found out how to make it work overnight when I was asleep. So I put together demos this morning, and I'm sure nothing is going to go wrong. So let's give it a try. OK, so this is a solution called .NET Standard Magic. And what we're going to do here is I am going to reference a, or I'm going to install, rather, a NuGet package, which is very old, called Power Collections. And I'm installing this in a .NET Standard 2 project, just to prove that to you. Uh, this is indeed a .NET Standard 2 project. So let's see if this works. That seems to have worked. Okay, and there we go. So we're now, we're now referencing power collections. And just to prove to you that it is a, a very old project, if I open the DLL in IL Spy, you'll see that it happens to be .NET 2. And this is not .NET Standard 2, this is .NET Framework 2, the one that was released in 2005 and was replaced in 2008. So, really, really, oh, it might be .NET 3.5. They didn't change the version number there. But anyway, it's a very old uh, version of the .NET framework, and clearly it's not one of the ones that's supported by .NET Standard 2, because that only supports 4.6.1 and above. However, this should compile. And there we go, it has compiled. Now. That's not too exciting in itself until we do this. So up here, I have a .NET Core 2 app. Just to prove that to you, there you go. That is, this is a .NET Core 2 console app. And I am going to reference from that .NET Core 2 app, 
I'm going to reference the .NET standard app, uh, the .NET standard library. And that should work. What I'm going to do now is, in the .NET standard library, I'm going to call something from Power Collections. It has a type called bag. I'll just add the usings. And that is now actually using Power Collections. What I'm going to do in the app is call into the .NET standard library. I'll just add my usings. And this is the moment of truth. Is this going to work? Boom. There we go. It works. So what's just happened there? We've got a .NET Core 2 application calling into a .NET Standard 2 uh, library. .NET Standard 2 library is calling into a .NET Framework 2 assembly. And things are just working. Right, that's that's uh, quite magical. I also thought, what happens if I cut out the middleman? What happens, what happens if I just go straight to the power collections from a .NET Core app? Uh, would, would that work? And this is uh, a little bit of a tangent, because this, is, this talk is not about .NET Core. It's about .NET Standard. Um, but I thought I'd give it a try. Uh, let's see. .NET Core magic. So, in here, I'm gonna, all I've got here is a .NET Core 2 app. And if I install the Power Collections lib again. Yes, thank you. OK, so we now, we've now got a reference to Power Collections from a .NET Core 2 app. right? And then we're going to call into it from here. OK, who thinks this is going to work? Not many of you. Who thinks it's not going to work? OK, a few more of you, and then most of you are undecided. Well, I didn't know if this is going to work. I gave it a try this morning, and it works. I found that quite surprising. That's, and that, that, is, uh, that actually says a lot. It means you can now reference any .NET framework assembly, or NuGet package at least, from a .NET Core 2 app. Pretty cool, huh? I thought I'd take things a little bit further, um, because the question I've been asked at this point when I've described this is, what happens if the .NET framework assembly calls something that's not available in .NET Core? What's going to happen? The only way to answer that is to give it a try. So I'm going to push my luck here, and I'm going to, uh, I'm actually going to install nServiceBus. And I know that nServiceBus calls things that are not available in .NET Core. It calls the registry, and it calls system configuration, and, uh, and all sorts. So let's install nServiceBus into the .NET standard project. And I've got here just a standard, don't worry about what this does. This is just setting up an end service bus endpoint. And I'm going to reference, oh yes, I need some musings. And I'm going to reference the .NET standard app again from a .NET Core app. All that does is call that run method um, with a bit of async uh, stuff sprinkled around it. All right, any guesses as to what happens? Sorry? An exception? Yes, well, you're right. There is an exception. I was hoping it would be an exception where it tries to call something that doesn't exist. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more boring. Uh, what happens is this. Final not found exception. 
uh, and it cannot find system configuration uh, because I guess there, there is no equivalent inside .NET Core for system configuration, so that's not being forwarded anywhere. So, um, if you're going to do this kind of thing, if you're going to use um, .NET Frameworks app, .NET Framework libraries from a .NET Core app using this magic, uh, test your app. All right? Don't don't lean on the compiler so much anymore. It doesn't tell you nearly as much as it used to. And I think where you, where we actually have types uh, that are not implemented, or where, where we have types that do exist in .NET Core, and you try and call a method that doesn't exist, it will just you just get miss, missing method exception or some weird compiler uh, runtime problem like that. So how does this magic work? Well. Uh, yes, if you want to try it, those are the repos. Again, this, uh, this uh, slide deck is online afterwards, so you can follow those links. And if you do want to try this, make sure you install this first, because the, the URL here, which talks about the release of Preview 1, tells you, what to in, tells you the things that you may have to install, but doesn't really tell you what you have to install. And I just could not get this working first, because um, this is the core bit that you need to install, and unfortunately, .NET Standard 2 Preview is bundled with .NET Core Preview into the same thing, which kind of uh, continues the, conf the, the confusion that exists between the two. But you must install this, and then you can use it in one of these. So my mistake was I installed Visual Studio Preview first and tried to use it, and that doesn't work unless you install the .NET Core 2 Preview. So how does this work? Right, again, the important thing is to separate compilation from runtime. Compilation. Your .NET standard class library references .NET standard DLL, just like it did last time. However, it's referencing a .NET framework class library, and that .NET framework class library is referencing the framework assemblies. So, for instance, MS Core Lib. Now, what .NET Standard 2 does is it ships its own version of the framework assemblies. So when you compile, you don't compile the .NET, you don't compile using the uh, MS Core lib that comes with the .NET framework. You compile with the, the MS Core lib that comes with .NET Standard. And that uses type forwarding again to type forward to .NET Standard DLL. So when this net framework class library wants system.object, it asks for, for that from MS Core Lib, and the MS Core Lib, the special version of MS Core Lib that ships with not net standard says, system.object actually lives in net standard. Right? Runtime. A little bit more complicated. Now, this is where I get into the area of speculation. Right, because I, I, I still have not been able to find out from the .NET team exactly how this works. And, uh, the, and actually trying this, as I said, is, is, this is hot off the presses. It's, it was only released eight days ago, uh, but it seems to work so far. So just to be clear, this is my best guess at what happens, and I hope to confirm this with the .NET team soon, but I haven't been able to do that yet. So with our... .NET Core application and our .NET standard class library, things are fairly simple and they're, they're, they're very similar to what I showed you before. The .NET standard class library references .NET standard DLL and the version of .NET standard DLL that ships with .NET Core type forwards back to the .NET Core assemblies. Right? So that's very similar to what we saw before. This is the bit where I start to speculate slightly, and the .NET Framework class library is referencing framework assemblies, as in MS Core Lib. .NET Core also ships versions of the framework assemblies, and that's why that demo worked, where I referenced power collections straight from .NET Core. Right, because .NET Core ships a version of MS Core Lib that type forwards back to a .NET Core assembly somewhere. And that same assembly is doing the work here. All right, so I think it works this way. It makes sense. 
but as you can see, it's all based around type forwarding. It's all based around DLLs pretending to have objects which they don't and actually forwarding the runtime to other places. So this magic does work. And the .NET team are confident this is going to be really, really useful because they did an analysis of every single NuGet package on the gallery and they analyzed to see what those NuGet packages were calling in the framework and they reckon that 70% of NuGet packages on the gallery which target .NET framework will just work with anything that targets .NET standard 2. So they don't call any APIs which are not available outside .NET standard and outside .NET core and the other platforms. So that takes care of the paralysis. And that, in a nutshell, is .NET Standard 2. So it's more APIs and reference anything. So as a, new, as a producer of a NuGet package, how do I actually start to support .NET Standard 2? How do I actually do that, or, or .NET Standard 1? Well, there are some really useful tools out there which help you do this. Uh, one of them is .NET API port, and this is a tool that comes in two flavors, a Visual Studio add-in, and I believe in the very latest uh, VS 2017 preview, this is included actually in Visual Studio out of the box. And it comes as a command line, if, you, if, that's, uh, if that's more your bag. Uh, so yeah, Visual Studio add-in, and that's very simple, it's just a right click and analyze, uh, or you can run it via the command line. And it goes off, and it looks through your assembly, and it looks at all the framework, framework APIs that you're calling. And it then says, um, it then will look at the various platforms, so uh, I'll best, best shown by an example. So if you run this for N-Service Bus Core, for instance, uh, N-Service Bus Core is our assembly. It targets .NET Framework 4.5.2, and then you can choose against which platforms to analyze this assembly. So as a control, I've chosen .NET Framework 4.5.2 here, and as you might expect, .NET Framework 4.5.2 has all the APIs that any service bus needs, obviously. Then I've chosen to analyze end service bus against .NET Standard 1.6, and unfortunately, .NET Standard 1.6 only supplies two thirds of the APIs that end service bus needs. So it's going to be quite challenging for us to support .NET Standard 1.6 from N-Service Bus. However, .NET Standard 2 has 87% of the APIs that N-Service Bus needs, so getting much closer. And incidentally, we've, de we've decided to target .NET Standard 2 because by the time we're done, .NET Standard 2 hopefully will be released and it's going to be a lot easier for us to do that. So, Faced with this situation, if I've got a NuGet package which is in a similar situation, how do I close that gap? How do I, how do I close that, 12, that, well, possibly a third or 12%, a 13% gap uh, in, in, in what that platform that I want to target does not support? Well, there are a few things you can do. One of them is to change, and there are two levels of change. So you can do internal change. Maybe your library is doing something via some APIs which can be done slightly differently with some other APIs which are available in .NET standard. If so, great. You don't have to change the public API of your library at all. You just change the calls that you're making. Right? That's, that's nice if you can do it. Uh, the other thing is to change uh, externally. So let's say you're exposing some API right now from your API and uh, you can figure out a way to do that differently, to expose a slightly different API to your users, which will allow you to call different things that are available in .NET standard. So that's an actual, that will end up being a breaking change in your API. So it'll be a major version bump, if you're following Semver. The other thing you can do is to separate. So this is actually one of the strategies that we're using for N-Service Bus. N-Service Bus currently has MSMQ support built into it. So other, other transports like RabbitMQ and Azure Service Bus are separate packages, but MSMQ being the original transport mechanism that we use is built into N Service Bus. And of course, because MSMQ is Windows only, MSMQ APIs do not exist in .NET Standard or .NET Core. 
So we're going to pull out MSMQ support into a separate package. And we're anticipating that that's going to take a large chunk of that, out of that missing 13%. After we do that, we're hoping to get much closer to 100%. And the last thing you can do, of course, is just remove. You know, maybe there are some old APIs that uh, are not really that useful anymore, and you, you think that people can do without them. Um, well, just, just whip them out, and maybe that will help as well. Um, but obviously, you may want to think about doing that last before you can maybe change and separate. Uh, another resource, APIs and versions. Um, uh, APIs of .NET is a really, really good resource. This lists every single type, every single method, property, enum that is available for any .NET platform that is out there. Uh, you can go to it and you can search for something like, uh, what did I search for? Oh, yes, iData Reader. So iData Reader is a, a fairly fundamental data type if you're playing with data. And you can go in here and have a look, and it will tell you exactly which uh, .NET platforms and which versions of those support uh, iData Reader. Uh, and as you can see, obviously all the .NET Framework versions support it. Uh, .NET Core supports it. .NET Standard only supports it in 2.0. Right, so this is one of the ones that's, that's being added back into 2.0. Uh, so that is really, really useful. Um, .NET Standard and .NET Core. So uh, this is a constant source of confusion. Uh, when I said that I was going to be talking about .NET Standard, and I asked the question, do people still get confused between the two? The answer was yes. It was an emphatic yes. So um, I hope with the explanations I've given so far that I've at least partially answered this question. Um, I mean, the, the, the key to it is that .NET standard is nothing more than a, I guess if you like, it's a contract which says, in order to support .NET standard 2, you must have these types and these methods and properties and the rest of it. And .NET Core is just one of the platforms. So you've got .NET standard, and then you've got .NET framework, Tizen, UWP, Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, .NET Core. It's just another one of those platforms. Right? And unfortunately, they do get very conflated, um, especially because you have to install the .NET Core preview to see the .NET Standard preview, for instance. And their timelines are, um, are bound together. They're, they're being released at the same times and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, most of that confusion uh, is evaporating. But obviously, in the discussion session afterwards, I'm more than happy to talk about that a little bit more. And this is just a demonstration of, uh, of this problem. So .NET Standard 2 Preview was, as I said, released uh, just recently. And hopefully, it's going to go RTM in Q3. But this is actually communicated in the .NET Core repo. And when you look at it, you actually see this. So you see .NET Core and .NET Standard together. So again, it's, it, because of this uh, conflation, it's difficult for people to separate the two in their mind. But I'm, I'm hoping that you guys, having listened here, will, will have a bit of understanding of the, of the difference between the two. Uh, this is another attempt at explaining this. So uh, David Fowler, who's uh, one of the quite well-known developers uh, in the .NET team, he attempted uh, another way to explain what the .NET standard and .NET core and what all the platforms are. And what he did was he actually wrote some code to demonstrate this. So each net standard is an interface, uh, and there is an interface then for each platform, and you've got inheritance between all of them describing uh, the relationship between them. So um, at the risk of confusing you more, I'm showing you this. I, I'm hoping that some of you will benefit from this. Um, but just briefly, this is a, a, little, a little snippet from it. Um, this is not the whole thing, but we've got .NET Standard 4 here. We've got .NET Standard 1.5 inheriting from .NET Standard 1.4, because it's a superset. Um, and we've then got .NET Core app supporting .NET Standard 1.5. We've got Xamarin iOS, Xamarin, all supporting .NET Standard 1.5, and then we've got UWP 1 only supporting net standard 4, 1.4, and we've got .NET Framework 4.6.1 supporting .NET standard 1.4, uh, 
And I've just realized that should be, well, that's interesting because I generated this automatically. Uh, maybe, maybe David has a bug in his code. Uh, but I think that should actually be referencing or inheriting from net standard 1.5. And obviously, net framework 4.6.1 inherits from net framework 4.6. Does that make any sense, or have I just confused you again? Anyway, it's, a, it, it's another way to look at it. Uh, so what does the future hold? Well, um, another question I get asked is that um, currently, well, if you look at the difference between .NET Standard 1.6 and 2.0, as I said, there's a vast number of APIs that have been added to .NET Standard 2. So um, it, for instance, put yourselves in the shoes of Samsung. Samsung currently support .NET Standard 1.6 with Tizen. In order to support .NET Standard 2, they have to implement another 20,000 APIs. Right? This is asking a lot of these platform vendors or producers. Uh, and what's going to happen then with 2.1 and 2.2 and possibly 3.0? Uh, is this going is, is this going to get worse and worse? Uh, are, are, is it going to be an enormous burden to keep supporting every new version that comes out because it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Well, the answer to is it, is it going to be a burden is yes. Obviously, if 2.1 is bigger than 2.0, even if it has one method, you have a burden to support that extra new method. However, I think that burden is going to be very small. The reason for that is because the enormous jump from 1.6 to 2.0 has effectively reintroduced most, if not all, of the useful APIs from things like .NET Framework 4.6.1, and only excludes the ones which clearly don't make sense on something like Mac or Linux, like the Registry API or MSMQ. Those things don't exist outside Windows. So, if we've now covered all the useful stuff, or most of the useful stuff, that is not platform specific, then we're probably not going to have to make that much more change. You know, I think there will be a 2.1, but I think it's going to be an incremental step. And there may be a 2.2, there may be a 2.3, but I think this is now going to slow down. It's gone from 1.0 to 1.6, it's gone like that, it's gone like this, 2.0, and there may be a slightly higher jump, but I think it will slow down and reach a kind of uh, a kind of optimum. And I don't know if there ever will be a 3.0. Uh, but there is, a, there is a committee which looks after this. There is a, um, they are called the .NET Review Board, uh, .NET Standard Review Board, and they review new APIs for inclusion in the standard. And the hope and the idea is that they will be very, very careful about what they choose to come into new versions of .NET Standard. Uh, they, they will not just be throwing APIs in there all over the place. Um, what you're probably going to see is new APIs being released in things like .NET Core. So .NET Core will introduce funky new things, and if it turns out that they're a really good idea, and they would really make sense in a .NET framework, and in UWP, and in Tizen, and all the rest of it, it will make its way into the .NET standard 2.1 or, or something else. So how did I do? Who now thinks that they could quite confidently explain what .NET standard is. A few of you, so I haven't done too badly. Um, and difference between .NET standard and .NET core? A, a few more of you, that, well that's really good. I'm glad that I'm, I'm making a dent in that, uh, in that bit of confusion. So um, you know, if, you, if you didn't put your hand up, I mean, you know, throw some questions at me. I mean, what, what, uh, is there anything that you would have liked me to answer that I haven't already? Uh, I have the question. Uh, you said that the um, standard, um, .NET standard 2.0 has a numerous number of methods and properties. Maybe there is an ambiguity to make the same stuff in several ways. Okay. So maybe no. Okay, so you're saying that .NET standard 2.0 is vast, it's very, very big, and there are a lot of APIs in there, and is there some ambiguity about how to achieve things? Well, no more ambiguity than there is in the .NET framework. Because the .NET Framework 4.6.1 supports .NET Standard 2.0. So .NET Framework 4.6.1 is not changing in order to support .NET 2.0. So 
excuse me. Uh, so if there is ambiguity in .NET Standard 2, it's only because there's ambiguity in .NET Framework 4.6.1 already. Because .NET Standard 2, .NET Framework 4.6.1 is like this, .NET Standard 2 is a subset. So the answer to your question is, yes, there probably is ambiguity, because the .NET Framework is not perfect. Uh, but the .NET Standard 2 does not add to it. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Okay. Ah. Uh, first of all, thank you for clarifying a lot of things. And uh, my question is, well, we have a network, uh, net standard uh, 2.0, uh, which is um, much more large and uh, intersection is bigger, so it makes sense. And uh, my question is, how uh, link everything paradigm is related to this? Or it's separate thing? And if it's separate, what is the purpose of, of it? If, uh, if uh, not uh, .NET Framework 2.0 doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't allow, doesn't support uh, net standard 2.0. Because if, if, you have, uh, uh, if you have some restriction of, uh, on your libraries, uh, so uh, referring uh, uh, to old libraries will violate it. So, so you say, I'm not sure I fully understand your question. So you're saying what is the purpose of what exactly? Uh, uh, link everything of paradigm. Of, link, of, of being able to reference anything? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, right, so, so, so that is to relieve the paralysis that I talked about. So the problem right now is that um, if, I'm, uh, if I have a library like Fake It Easy, for instance, which is a mocking library, um, we use Castle Core to do the really grungy heavy lifting. Now, we now support .NET Standard 1.6 in Fake It Easy. But we had to wait for Castle Core to support .NET Standard before we could do that, right? And that took a long time. It took quite a long time for Castle Core to support .NET Standard. Once they did, we could go and do the work to support, uh, to support .NET Standard 1.6 in Fake It Easy, because Castle Core supported it, we can now reference it, and we can support it. But if things work like they do in .NET Standard 2, we wouldn't have had to wait for Castle Core. Castle Core could have stayed on the .NET framework, and we could just reference it and just target .NET Standard 1.6. Obviously, with very thorough testing to make sure that Castle Core is not calling something that doesn't exist in, say, .NET Core, because once Fake It Easy supports .NET Standard, you can use it in a .NET Core test project. So it would have taken all that waiting out of the equation. We could have probably supported .NET Standard 1.6 six months earlier from Fake It Easy. Does that answer your question? Uh, so uh, will it allow you to create a NuGet package which supports the net standard 2.0? Um, yes, will it allow you to create a package which supports? Yes, it will, yes. So once, once, .NET stand, once Fake It Easy is producing a .NET standard 1.6 assembly, even though Castle Core is supporting .NET framework, in the 2.0 world, I can just package Fake it easy and say, there you go, it supports .NET Standard 1.6 or 2.0, if that was the case. Uh, have we got any more time? Five minutes. Uh, and I have a question about versioning. So uh, 2.0, 2.1, 3.0, as of semantic, that's one thing. And another, what is deprecation policy for, for something? If, do we want, do we, are we removing something from new? Uh, versions of .NET standard, and uh, if yes, then how this happens? Excellent question, and a point I forgot to cover, actually, which I intended to. So, um, versioning. Um, this is really interesting. Versioning is always interesting. Uh, the, in the initial intention with .NET standard was to follow Semver, so that they had the, they had the ability to make a breaking change i.e. remove an API or change one and simply bump the major version. And they did that initially. So initially, .NET Standard 2 was going to be breaking. They were actually going to remove some APIs that were in 1.5 and 1.6, and it would only be compatible with 1.4. And 
there was a bit of an outcry about this. The community basically threw its toys out of the pram and said, no, that's not good enough. And they backtracked on that and, and they said, well, no, actually we're going to make .NET Standard 2 compatible with .NET Standard 1.6. However, so what you, what you would do then in Semver terms is call it 1.7, right? But no, uh, yeah, marketing or uh, release, you know, big exciting release concerns took over and they decided to stick with .NET Standard 2. So even though it's a major version bump, uh, it is not breaking, uh, which stri isn't strictly against Semver, um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, 3.0, I don't know if that will be breaking or just, hey, there's lots of new stuff. I don't think, putting it that way, I don't think there is gonna be 3.0. I would speculate there isn't going to be one because I don't think they're going to add loads and loads of new stuff to it at any time and they're probably not going to break it. But that's just my best guess. It's up to the .NET standard team to, to eventually do that. Okay, so um, I will be in the discussion area afterwards so we can talk about this a little bit more. Um, uh, I've talked about in-service bus a lot during this, so if, if any of you are curious, you can satisfy your curiosity by following these uh, URLs. Um, if you want an intro to, what, to see what service, uh, this thing that I've been talking about is. And if you're interested in .NET Core and .NET Standard news, um, you can sign up uh, here to, uh, to, to a mailing list where we curate uh, various things about what's happening in that community and what we're doing to support .NET Standard. So just to wrap up, um, this was a tweet that was uh, tweeted sometime, well, at the end of 2016. Um, and Martin here is saying, well, .NET deserves, nay needs better tooling in 2017. 2016 was rough. And I tend to agree with that. I think uh, 2015 even and 2016 have, a little, have been quite rough uh, in terms of tooling and um, and these various new bits that have been released. Um, but I replied to that and said I'm optimistic about 2017. And I really am, and I think that my optimism is, is being proved now. Uh, now that we've got VS 2017, uh, we've now coalesced back onto CS Proj. Uh, you know, there's no more dichotomy between Project JSON and CS Proj. We're back on one thing. And with the release of .NET Standard 2, and .NET Core 2, I think things are getting back to where they should be. I think we, .NET kind of had a bit of a kind of deviation, but we're kind of getting back onto the highway now. And .NET Standard in particular is one thing that I think is already proving its worth. You know, .NET Core, let's see. .NET Core 2.0 I think is the one which we all want and want to use. Um, I know that some people are already using .NET Core, but let's see. Uh, but .NET Standard, I think, regardless of that, is already proving its worth, and that's why I decided to talk about it. So I hope you've enjoyed it, and I will be in the discussion area afterwards. And thanks very much for coming to my talk. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.